you can start yeah, yeah. so yeah we are very happy to have uh, shai moran uh, who just uh, as he was saying a month back uh, came back from the us he was with google brain i suppose and uh, he just joined uh, uh, technion as a new faculty so shai has a very broad interest uh, and uh, what i really like is is particularly doing very interesting work at the intersection of convex geometry and theoretical computer science he's going to talk about uh, such things uh, today so shai over to you okay so uh, thank you arkadev uh, very much for the for this invitation um before we start let me just ask uh, <clears throat> the audience if there are any questions that please please ask I mean, um, and if you do so via chat, then I will, then Ram Prasad will let me know, right? Because uh, I'm still yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. Good, great. Okay, so um, yeah, so today I'll talk about uh, uh, a work with uh, Mark Braverman, Gilad Kohl, and uh, Raghuvan Saxena, all from Princeton. And this work uh, is about. Uh, distributed learning, if you will, but it also, uh, like from, from a technical perspective, it has a lot of uh, geometry, combinatorics, um, and everything should be quite basic. So, so please, uh, please raise your hand if you don't understand something. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, I'll first start with giving a background and, uh, and, and stating the main results. This should take maybe 20 minutes. Then I'll, I'll go over some of the proofs ideas. And then we'll finish with future research and probably we won't have time for the bonus part, which is about uh, combinatorial, statistical combinatorial open problem or concept, which has many interesting problems, but uh, we'll see. I'll probably not get there. Okay, so the most basic problem we're going to study is the following. Imagine we have a fixed universe, finite universe, which is a subset of RD. So it can be, for example, all uh, points that can be represented with some, some precision and with a node by n the size of this universe. And imagine that we have two players, Alice and Bob. Each of them gets as an input, a subset of the universe. And their goal is to determine whether the two subsets can be separated by a hyperplane. Equivalent, equivalently, whether the convex hulls of their subsets are disjoint or not, right? By the separation theorem. Um, so let me just stress that the domain is known, you, the domain, the universe is known to both parties. So as I said before, it may be all points within, that can be represented within certain precision. Uh, yes, okay, so the, so the communication protocol may depend on the domain. Okay, we will consider the standard communication model by uh, Yao. So um, uh, the, the parties, they communicate round by round. In each round, one of the parties sends a bit to the other party, and they can, um, yeah, and, 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 and the goal is to minimize the total number of bits. Okay, so let's let's do a quick warm up. So let's think about this problem in one dimension, on the real line. So here, you know, Alice gets red points on the, re on the real line and both gets blue points on the real line. And what are the convex halves of these red and blue points? These are just the minimum inter minimal intervals that contain this set, right? So basically the, the convex halves or the intervals are disjoint if the interval of Alice is to the right of, uh, of the interval of Bob or vice versa, namely if x right is less than y left or y right is x and x left when x right, x left, y right, y left are the extreme points in their inputs. Okay, so we see that in this case, the, the convex edit problem amounts to solving um, 
a greater than uh, relation, computing a greater than relation or two greater than relations. And, and this problem has been well studied in the literature, like maybe that Alice and Bob gets, each of them gets a number and they need to decide whether one is greater than the other. And yeah, it is known that the deterministic complexity is log n, and this is like the upper bound is trivial. So Alice can just transmit Bob the two endpoints, namely x left and x right, and then Bob can compute if one of them lies in his interval. And it can also be done in a randomized manner yeah, and uh, actually much faster. Then one only needs log log n bits and this is based on a, on a clever uh, hashing argument combined with binary search. Okay, so, so just to, to summarize, so in one dimension, this problem amounts to just comparing two numbers, which is, has the same complexity. And, and yeah, and, and this problem is well known and, and quite simple to solve. So we just need log n bits or log log n even. Now what happens in the other extreme? So imagine now that we, we, we live in n dimensions. So the points, the domain is in n dimensions. Then we can pick the domain U to consist of n independent uh, vectors. Okay, you can just take all unit vectors, for instance. This would be the domain. And once the, the vectors are linearly independent, then we have this property that the convex hulls are disjoint, if and only if the sets themselves combinatorially are disjoint. In fact, to for, that, for this to hold, we only need affine independence. We don't need linear independence, but linear independence is certainly enough. And um, yeah, so we see that once we live in, in dimension N, once we consider this problem in dimension N, then we just, we just get an, a combinatorial problem of deciding whether the subsets are disjoint. So there is no added value from the geometry. And so this is equivalent to the, to the famous uh, problem of set disjointness, which was well studied in this context of Yao's model. And it is well known that uh, basically there is nothing, um, uh, there is no non-trivial protocol for this problem, namely the protocol in which Alice sends Bob the indicator function. So for each of the endpoints, whether it's in her set or not in her set, so she just sends him n bits and then Bob decides is an optimal protocol or an almost optimal protocol in this context. Okay. So in dimension one, we've seen that it is very easy, right? We just need logarithmic communication, log n bits or all of log n bits. And when the dimension is n, it becomes as hard as it can get. So we need the basically n bits. And it is natural to ask what happens for intermediate D. What, what happens if D is a constant, or if D is square root N, or if D is log N? Which, um, how does this function, how does this, the complexity grow with D? Okay, so this is the first, the most basic problem, convexity jointness. Now let me tell you a little bit about distributed optimization, which is an another problem we will, uh, we will study. So I'm sure you all heard about linear programming. This is um, basically we're given a collection of constraints in RD, linear inequalities, and the decision problem uh, um, asks to determine whether these constraints can be simultaneously satisfied by some point in RD. Now in the distributed world, the constraints are are distributed among different parties. So it's no longer the, true, the, the case that all the constraints are access, accessible by the central computer, but we have several sites and in each site there are some constraints and the sites can communicate between each other to determine whether uh, all of the constraints are simultaneously satisfiable. And the most basic, uh, the most basic uh, setting 
in, in this distributed world is when you when we have two parties, Alice and Bob. And Alice has some of the constraints, Bob has the other part, and they need to decide whether uh, the constraints are satisfiable. Now, if you if you think about it a little bit, and you you can you can see that convex at jointness and this decision LP problem are in fact equivalent. They are dual to one another. And this is because if you if you go to if you if you dualize the, the convex service jointness, then the points become half spaces, the hyperplanes or half linear inequalities. And the separating hyperplane between the two convex halves amounts to a point which satisfies all the linear inequalities. Right? You just take the, the usual uh, duality between points and hyperplanes, and uh, and this basically translates between the two problems. Okay, so this is another um, a point of view, uh, which may may appear more practical. Uh, now let let us talk about distributed learning, which is the last uh, kind of problem we will consider. So first of all, some inspiration. So in learning, our goal is to approximate uh, an unknown target concept from uh, examples. Um, so you can imagine uh, in you know, in the distributed uh, world. So uh, when, when we train music recommendation apps, then the examples, the user preferences are distributed on our smartphones, iPads, laptops, etc. So, you know, we can always send all the data from all of the users to one centralized machine, train the deep learning network or whatever on the centralized model, and then uh, use it to predict in the future. And the question, but, but, you, but you know, this has disadvantages. It's a communication, uh, it can be expensive. And also there are some maybe privacy concerns for uh, data to, to the central machine. So it makes sense to, to ask, it's natural to ask whether you can, we can efficiently learn in a distributed fashion. And again, we will consider the most, maybe the most problem in learning theory, uh, which is learning of half spaces. So this underlies neural networks, kernel machines, etc. So let me formally describe the problem now, the learning problem. So again, we assume a fixed domain, finite domain, U subset RD. Now the inputs of Alice and Bob are examples. Each example is a pair, XI, AI, where XI is a point in the universe and AI is the label, minus or plus. Okay, so we have these labeled examples distributed between the parties. And we assume, we, we assume that the target concept we're trying to learn is a half space. So the positive and negative examples can be separated by some hyperplane. And the goal of the parties of Alice and Bob is to agree on a function which is defined on the entire universe and is consistent with the examples, namely all the positive points are on the positive side of the function and the negative points are on the negative side. Okay, so this is the learning problem we consider. Of course, you can also ask about uh, what, what, what if we can allow some error and these are all natural questions, but uh, but this, uh, this particular instance is actually quite universal. If you solve this one, then you can, in many, many cases, you can also solve the bounded error case and uh, other variants. Uh, Shai, uh, so they can agree on a function which is not necessarily a half space? That's an excellent question. So yes, they, in, in learning, in general, we agree to use functions that are not uh, from the concept class that is being learned. And in fact, uh, this is what is happening, for example, when we do boosting or uh, also with, with neural nets. So, you know, they have this example where you try to learn a neural net with, let's say, two layers. And then in order to learn it well, you actually need to use three layers or four layers. And then the, the redundancy somehow uh, accelerates the learning process. So, so, so we will definitely be interested also in learning 
when the target, when the hypothesis, when the function that is being outputted by the parties is not a half space. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Shai, so the, the Bob's inputs are the Y coordinates, right? It's like Y I comma V I. Uh, so. No, 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 no. So, so okay, that's that's important. So. Each example, both Alice, ah, I guess. Uh, so X, we are thinking of as just a vector, right? A specific point in RD. Uh, X, uh, okay. So I think, uh, yeah, the, the, you're right. There is a typo here. So the, so yeah, so each of Alice, uh, let, me, let me change it really fast. You can see it. Let's call it Y, but it's not the Y coordinate. It's just, but it's a different set of vectors in R D. Set of points in yeah. U. You see, all of these points are in U. So you see. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah. Bob's input and Alice's input are examples. Every example is a pair. The first entry is a point in the universe, and the second entry is the label. Okay, but it's not the case that Alice gets some of the coordinates of the points and Bob gets the other part of the coordinates. If Bob gets a particular point, then you see the entire point and the label. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. So for example, you can imagine that Bob will get all the red points and Alice will get all the blue points and they need to find the separator. This is one case, one, one particular case. When Okay. Any other questions about the? Uh, uh, I just have a general question. You know, when you think of separating, finding out if two convex sets can be separated by a hyperplane, and as you mentioned, it's a simpler problem in lower dimension. It seems like one should look for projections and see if there exists a projection where things uh, can be separated. Is that an approach that people use? Do you, you know? In practice, you mean, or in theory? I can tell in, you about. In theory, I mean, it seems like the way one way to approach this problem is to look at kind of all kinds of projections in lower dimensions and find a projection where there is a separation. Okay. Then you have the answer. If you can't find so, a projection, then you don't. Okay, so so projecting is useful if there is also an assumption about the margin of the points, mm -hmm. and if you if you assume that the points are not too close to one another. And then projection, a random projection indeed can be very useful. And this is, I, I don't know if, if they project, but they use standard optimization uh, algorithms such as ellipsoid and cutting plane methods, which also utilize the margin. But they are not general in the sense that if, you, if your universe is wild, if you, if the set you contains, you know, points that are in very general position, then this will not, uh, then projection, I don't see how it helps in, in the most general form of this problem. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's continue. So let me you now uh, state the main results and some open questions already, actually, because uh, you will see the results are not tight. Uh, so let us first consider the problem of learning, distributed learning of half spaces. So previous works, and I only only consider here dimension greater than one, so at least two. So uh, yeah, so uh, Daumet Al and Balkanet Al established a D log square n protocol. Okay, so uh, and for lower bounds, there was a work uh, with uh, Daniel and Roy uh, and Jasa and the Amir, where we showed the. Uh, D plus log n as a lower bound. Okay. And uh, what we show is that for every domain u, there is a learn protocol that depends on u for half spaces with communication complexity D log D log n. Okay. And uh, our protocol is deterministic. And uh, if you also want to efficiently implement it, then, you, then public randomness uh, is useful. Uh, the protocol is improper. So I was previously asked whether you can output uh, something which is not a half space, and definitely this is the case in this protocol. It is not a half space. It is some decision tree of half spaces, uh, the final output. 
and and it is open to to, to you know to decide whether this can be achieved with a with a proper protocol that outputs a half half state. Um, so yeah. shy for uh, uh, proper learning. Uh, the previous lower bound is still the best known lower bound, the one that you showed in the previous slide. Uh, in the randomized case, I think it is. For deterministic, maybe there were other, there were better. Yeah, in the randomized case, I think yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, and we also provide an open. Yes, sir, as a question. Uh, so, is is there a comp is there a dependence in the previous theorem on the complexity of U? Uh, so. So if I just take you to be all of R D, uh... oh, so so you, so you see, you cannot be all of R D because we assume that they communicate bits. Uh -huh, okay, okay. Uh -huh. So you, so you it's not R D. You is some is some arbitrary finite subset of R D. Okay, but and there's then, no dependence upon its size. Uh, so, oh, so, so, n is a, n is a, n is a, sorry, n, n is, is the, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Very good. No, no, that's, that, these are very important questions because. Uh, Okay, good. So we almost we also give an almost matching lower bound uh, of d log n over d. Okay, so before we had d log d log n, and now it's d log n over d. So if you use the tilde notation, then you can claim its type. Um, and of course, our lower bound applies also for randomized protocols. And for improper protocols, namely even for protocols that output an arbitrary function that is not a half space. And, and yeah, let me just mention one short technical remark that, you know, this is a search problem. And the way we usually lower, give lower bounds for search problems is to, is to study the corresponding decision problem, which is the convex disjointness problem uh, described earlier. But there is a subtlety here because the convexity jointness only gives a lower bound for proper protocols. If you assume that the output is a half space, right? If you want to say that any algorithm for the search problem implies an algorithm for the decision problem, then one has to assume that the algorithm is proper. And the lower bound here, because it applies for improper protocols, it requires a more complicated uh, promise variant of uh, the convex edit jointness problem. But this is just a, a quick technical remark, footnote for experts. Okay, so let's continue. So now uh, let's, uh, let me describe the main results for the decision problem, LP visibility and convex edit jointness. As I said, they are the same. Um, so the previous work, so there is a, O tilde D cube log square N, again by us and by also by Vempala. And the Vempala et al. also gave a, a D, D squared log N protocol, but this is under the assumption that U is a grid. So the universe is, uh, is nice in some sense. And lower bound, so again, there is a lower bound from before, the D plus log N. Vempala et al. Et al gave a a log n protocol which applies even when u is agreed. So they only consider this case when u is agreed. So the, their upper bound is easier and the lower bound is harder to derive. And they also gave a lower bound of omega d log n for deterministic protocols. Um, okay. Now we basically match up to this log d term, which I think they also have. Uh, the, the, the bound of Vempala et al for grids, but we do it for arbitrary u. So we get uh, OD squared log D log n, uh, communication complexity, the problems. And again, it's a deterministic protocol. It can be efficiently implemented given public randomness, and it applies for arbitrary domain, not necessarily grids. And as for lower bounds, we give again the same lower bound as before, the D log n over D. Um, and of course, there is an, an open question here. So what is the correct dependence? Is it d log n or is it d squared log n? 
right? What happens if D equals square root N, for instance, right? If D is square root N, then D squared is already N, so you can just use the trivial protocol of sending each other's input. Can you do anything non-trivial for D equals square root N? Okay. So this is, um, these are the, the main results. And now let me describe some of the technical tools. So we have some, some you know, some uh, tools we, we developed in geometry that were very so useful. Sh uh, just a question about the model. So Alice's input consists of these x1, x2, uh, so on. And they, they also come labeled whether there's, there was an AI, uh, A1, A2, A3 attached to each of them. So uh, you're bound, I mean, this is for worst case, that is for every possible input of Alice and every possible input of Bob. Uh, I mean, these are not random inputs uh, given to Alice. No, no, these are, these are definitely not random inputs, definitely not. Uh, and, um, yeah, yeah, so, so you're right. So the, the model is a worst case model. In the learning problem, the, the inputs are labeled with pluses and minuses. In the training problem, there are no labels. And the input is, is uh, distributed in a worst case manner. And this is often the case, like um, also in practice. So it could be that, you know, uh, hospitals, they try to, to train a classifier on data that, that, uh, that exists in both places. But here you have more positive uh, cases and here you have more negative cases. So, so we do, yeah, anyway, so it's a worst case and it's also, it is also the problem which is studied mostly in distributed learning, that the, distribu the distribution of inputs is the worst case rather than a random one. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, now we'll switch to, to a more uh, mathematical discussion, a geometric discussion about the tools that we use in, in, the, in this work. And then later, I hope I'll have time to, to show you the algorithm at least. And by the way, do let me know when I have like 10 minutes before, or five minutes before, before I need to finish. Sure, okay. Okay, so, um, so here is one, one important object that we, we we studied in this, that arises in this context. So, so remember that U is our domain, it is endpoints in RD. Now imagine that we have H and C that are two subsets of RD. Then we say that C, epsilon contains H, if it contains H, so the C, H is a subset of C, and C minus H, the difference contains at most epsilon fraction of the points from the domain. Okay, so it contains H and it's almost equal to H on at least uh, as far as for the points from U. There is a small fraction of points from U that is not in, uh, that is in, uh, in H, but not in C. Okay. And of course you could consider this definition and we will for arbitrary measures on RD. So given an arbitrary measure mu on RD, we say that C epsilon contains H. If H is a subset of C, and the difference has measure at most epsilon. So here we take mu to be the uniform distribution over U. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is what I said. Uh, it, it can naturally extend to distributions. And um, yeah, so this is one of the results we, this actually our main uh, workhorse is that for every domain, every universe U, or for even for every measure mu, there exists a family whose size depends only on D, on the dimension and on epsilon, which is D over epsilon to the order of D, sets that universally uh, contain, epsilon contain every half space, namely for every half space in RD, notice that there are infinitely many half spaces, there exists one of these finitely many sets, uh, a container that epsilon contains H. So it contains H, but the difference is only epsilon. 
Okay, is the, is the definition clear in the theorem? Uh, H being a half space is important to, to this definition, uh, to this uh, family oh, of course. containment uh, containers? Of course, of course, of course. It's uh, so you can ask more generally which which subsets, like half spaces or uh, I don't know, zeros of polynomials or which families of subsets have this property that they can have containers of size independent of, uh, of uh, that depends only on, on uh, p and epsilon. And uh, it's not hard to see that such families must be restricted. And, uh, and in this context, we need half spaces. But, but, but this is a natural question to ask in general, like combinatorially, which families of sets have this property? Can we admit small containers? Okay. So yeah, so as I said, the, the crucial property here is that the upper bound on the size of C does not depend on N. It is only a function of T and epsilon. And for those of you that are familiar with Hausfeld's packing lemma, notice that this is a strictly stronger notion because the uh, Hausfeld's packing lemma is, is about a symmetric difference, and here is the set is the is really the difference. Um, uh, but I, I don't want to get into it. Um, so, uh, Shai, uh, if uh, in say dimension two, if the points were arranged on a circle, so the picture that you have is roughly the answer. Uh, Meaning, so uh, you, you ask how, what is the family C? How do we construct it? No, so I'm, I just want to uh, understand why I should believe this theorem. So if you have the points arranged, n points arranged, let's say uniformly on a circle, mm -hmm. um, and we are only considering hyperplanes, let's say half spaces which pass through the origin or something, then uh, are these, uh, I mean, the kind of blue, uh, things in your picture, roughly, what uh, will do the job? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So the, the in, in the plane, the family of containers will look like the blue people. It's a union of two two half spaces, two half planes. We will pick a union of, of we will pick d over d over or in in the plane it will be one over epsilon to the four. Um, such sets that are unions of half planes, two half planes. Okay. Um, yes, and yeah, so here it is also like a, this combinatorial speed geometric uh, question, like what is the right dependence on D? And let me also just make a remark that it is um, strongly, it is, it is very intimately related to the notion of bracketing from statistics, universal bracketing for those of you who are work with. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think there is a lot of, uh, there are many interesting questions in this context. So it's related to statistics, it's related to computational geometry. It has many, we found out that there are many connections to basic notions in other fields. Um, okay. And the the next uh, geometric statements I want to 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 mention are variants of Karateodori theorem. So uh, recall that the Karateodori theorem tells you that if a point X is in the convex hull of a set Y in R D, then X belongs to a simplex in of Y. So X there is a Y prime subset of Y such that x is in the convex hull of y prime and the size of y prime is at most dimension plus one. So in the plane, it just means that you can triangulate any, any convex poly, polygon. So, uh, right, so any point which is in, a, in the convex hull of these blue vertices, you can already find a triangle that, uh, that contains this uh, red point. Uh, so here is one uh, symmetric variant which arises in this communication world. Which we which we proved it's not complicated, but I just think it's a, it's an elegant uh, variation. Uh, the proof is essentially the same. Uh, so yeah, so what is the symmetric variant? So assume now we have two sets instead of point in the set, we have two sets x and y that are uh, can be separated by a hyperplane. The convex hulls are joined, 
then you can find two small subsets. I mean, I mean they cannot be separated, I'm sorry. Assume you have two sets that uh, have a point, uh, in, uh, there is a point in the convex hull of both of them, common point. Then you can find two small sets, x prime and y prime, the, the sizes of x prime and y prime sum up to something less or equal than d plus two, such that the convex hulls of these two small subsets are already disjoint. So you can witness that the convex sets intersect with small convex subsets. And the uh, right way is something like this. So here we have the, the, this blue and red the polygons that are intersect, but we can already witness the intersections by taking these two edges that intersect. And, and uh, as you can see, it's two plus two is four, which is uh, d plus two in the plane. Uh, and notice that it implies the original gravity ordinary by taking the set X to be the singleton X. And then if the convex cell of X and convex cell of Y intersect, just means that this, the, the point X is in the convex cell of Y, and then D plus two gives you precisely uh, D plus one points in Y. And yeah, the, the proof is simple. It's a linear algebraic argument, very similar to the, to the one used in the classical curvature theory. Um, and the second variant of the theory theorem is a dual variant. And I think it is also, uh, actually we already used it in another work in related to privacy. But that, so let me present it. Uh, so, you know, they're representing polytops in RD. There are two natural ways of doing it. One is by vertices. So it's the convex, of every polytop is a convex hull of its vertices. And the other representation, which is more uh, common in linear programming, is as the intersection of half spaces. Okay, so you can think of it as two dual ways of representing polytops in RD. And if you think about it, then the standard Karatiodoli theorem implies that if P has n vertices, then you can cover you can cover P by n choose d plus one or n to the d plus one roughly sub simplices right so if p if the polytope can be has a simple short description in terms of few vertices then it can be covered by few simplices you can ask yourself about the dual question so what happens if if, if the polytope has a simple description in terms of intersection of half places so we prove a dual variant and we show that if P is the intersection of M half spaces, then it can be covered by M to the D sub -simplices. So roughly the same dependence. And again, the moral is that if you have a short dual description of P, then also you can cover it by a few sub -simplices. And let me just mention that uh, there is a, a, co a corollary to the, to the Classical Karateodori theorem gives you a bound of m to the d squared roughly, because every vertex is, can be encoded by d half spaces. And therefore, if you have m half spaces, then you have at most m to the d vertices. And you get this kind of bound by applying the previous theorem. But uh, if you want to, to, to improve upon this uh, uh, you know, quadratic factor in the exponent, then, uh, then more complex argument is needed. Um, okay. And the, yeah, our proof is also constructive. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to cover it. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, just one thing, uh, Shai. So we mm -hmm. started at uh, 410. So, I mean, you easily have until 510, I mean, just to be, yeah, yeah, I don't know uh, what is five ten here. So it's uh, oh right, right, right. So okay. so it's been it's been forty minutes so far. Right. So we have twenty minutes more. Right. Certainly, yeah. Okay. Good. So at least we'll see the algorithm. Okay. Uh, hi, Shai. I have a question. Uh, the container theorem that you said was that constructive? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, I hope, I mean, I prefer, I, but I probably won't uh, have time to, let's see, let's go to the algorithm and maybe I uh, can even say a few words about it. It's constructive, but uh, you, you need randomness. It uses sampling. Okay, so let's uh, continue. Any yes. other questions? Okay, good. Okay, so um, yeah, so let us now see some, uh, some ideas, maybe at least the algorithm. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's see the algorithm for the people to learn of house basics. So let me remind you what the problem is. So again, we have the same typos as before. Alice gets labeled examples, Bob gets labeled examples. And they need to, to, we assume that, you know, the, the positive and negative examples are separated by some hyperplane. And their goal is to agree on a function which, uh, which uh, separates, which is consistent with the input. And the function is the entire, it should be defined over the entire domain. So let's see the upper bound. Uh, yeah, so the upper bound, again, the statement is that you can do it in just uh, d log d log n bits. Um, so we will first <clears throat> consider the simpler case where Alice only gets positive examples and Bob only sees negative examples. Okay, so there are no, uh, later we will solve the, the more general case, but it will be convenient to start with this uh, assumption. So our protocol, we will, I will show you a protocol now that takes log n rounds. In each round, it will use d log d bits. So the total number of bits will be as stated, d log d times log n. And what we will do is we will construct the output function round by round. So we will start with a function that is defined nowhere. And in every round, uh, it will be defined on all but a three over four to the k fraction of the domain. So after log domain size number of rounds, roughly, it will be defined everywhere. Um, and also, as you will see, the, the, the crux of this algorithm is this container uh, uh, theorem. Okay, so are you ready? So let's, let's see the algorithm. So you can imagine that the input looks like this. So uh, Bob's inputs are the negative examples, Alice's input are the positive examples, and the black, the black points are just points that are in the domain, but are not, are not in the inputs, or not given as inputs. So, so. Okay, so, uh, so beforehand, Alice and Bob, they agree on a family of containers with epsilon equals one quarter. And let me just remind you that the size, by the theorem, the size of such a family uh, can be chosen is at most d to the o, o of d. So they can choose such a family whose size is at most d to the two d or something like that. Okay, so they, they agree beforehand and the, so they both know these families and they, can, they, they have the description. So they can describe a member, a container in this family using d log d bits essentially. Right, because it's log size of the family. So here's the idea. So consider a hyperplane H which separates the positive and negative examples. And, and this, this hyperplane is not known to Alice or Bob and Bob. We just imagine it for now. So one of its sides contains at most half of the points in U in the domain. Right, this, this hyperplane partitions the domain into two sets. One of them is smaller or, or, or not larger. So let's assume it's the negative side, right? It's the side of Bob, contains at most half of the points. Then Bob can find, so there, if you take a container of this half space, it will contain at most three quarters of all points. Right, because the container contains the half space and in the difference between the container and the half space, there are at most epsilon equals one quarter fraction of the points. So altogether, this container contains at most three quarters of all points. Right, so Bob can check whether there is a container that contains all of its inputs 
and at most one quarter of the and at most one quarter, three quarters of all points. And Alice does the same. And one of them must be able to find such a container because we just proved it exists because there exists a separating hyperplane, right? So, so the lemma here is that there must exist a container which contains all of the inputs of one of the players and at most three quarters of the universe. Okay, so, and, and once let's say Bob finds such a container, he can just send Alice the name of this container using D log D bits. And then we know that outside this container, all points must be red because the container contains all of Bob's input, which is blue. So we can just label all the points outside the container positive. So now we define the function h, the, the, the final function h to be red on all of these points outside the container. We remove them. So we remove at least a one quarter fraction of the points. And we repeat with the remaining universe. So again, we pick a family of containers for whatever is left and we repeat exactly the same reasoning. So in each iteration, we discard one quarter, a fraction of one quarter of the remaining points. And uh, this will take at most log n iterations, order of log n. Okay, so this is the case where, uh, you know, where uh, we assume that all positive points belong to Alice and all negative points belong to, to the other party. What happens if they have both? So, so this, you know, this is, an, this is I think like an, an, an exercise that requires some meditation, but it's not too complicated. So, so, let's, so the picture is like this. So now you see that Alice's input is A. So she has both red and blue points and Bolis's input is labeled B. He also has both blue and the red. So they, they use the following reduction to the previous case. So they apply the previous protocol on Alice's positive, positive versus both negatives. And so twice, and on Alice's negative versus both positives, right? So they can apply the previous protocol and then they get something like this. They get two separators, not necessarily half spaces, but two separators. And then the observation that these two separators, they, they partition the space to four regions. And the plus plus region must contain only positives. The minus minus must contain only negatives. And then the, the mixed regions, plus minus contains only A's, only Alice's inputs, and minus plus contains only Bob's inputs. So on the, on the mixed uh, region, the plus minus and minus plus, each of them can find separately uh, learn privately uh, a separator, a hyperplane that separates uh, within the, the, this mixed region and trans transmit the name of this hyperplane, which is just the log n bits to the other party. So altogether we solved, we, we, we applied the previous protocol twice and we transmit an extra uh, number of 2D log n bits. So the total complexity will be uh, the same. Um, yeah, so the final classifier looks something like this. So it's, it is a partition of the space to, by these, uh, to these uh, C, six uh, regions. And on each region, uh, you know the, the parties can label the region monochromatically. Every region is monochromatic. Uh, okay. Yes, so let us just summarize it and then see what we can do next. Uh, yes, so we proved that for every finite domain U of n points, there is a length protocol for half traces on U whose communication complexity is D log D log N. And the crux, as we saw, was the container uh, theorem. And um, so I, I still have 10 minutes, right? Yes. Okay, so let's uh, so let's maybe let me try and uh, describe the, some ideas about the proof of the container theorem in this time. Uh, or do you rather hear open questions? What do you rather hear more? Proofs or open questions? Uh, 
Ram Prasad, what do you prefer? Uh, I mean, I'd like to see the proof of this container theorem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, so recall. So let, let me now uh, state it uh, with uh, measures instead of points. So the theorem says that for every distribution mu on R D, there exists a family whose size depend only on the dimension and the epsilon, the approximation parameter such that uh, every half space is epsilon covered by one of the members in this family. Okay, so we have a small families which epsilon contains every half space, right? So for every half space, there is a container that contains it and the measure of the difference is at most epsilon. Uh, okay. So, so Shai, just one thing. I mean, uh, this half space container theorem, since uh, this family C is a family of arbitrary sets. This is the only place where the the non uh, what do you say the non properness uh, seeps in. Uh, not only, but also because you know because uh, so this is even if there were half spaces, still uh -huh. if you remember the protocol goes round by round and in each round, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Even part of the yeah. universe you get kind of a decision tree, right? It is, it's, a, it's a decision tree of containers. The, the final output. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. So the proof, as I said, it's, it's constructive. So this is the idea. So given an input half space H, we efficiently output a container C for H, and the description of C will only use d log d over epsilon bits. And hence the theorem follows, right? Because I give you a, a I give you a an algorithm that given an input H outputs a description using d log d over epsilon bits of a set that epsilon contains h. So this, uh, just take all possible descriptions and you get, uh, you get uh, two to the size of the description is the size of the, of the family. So it's, it's exactly what we said. So the construction has two parts. The first part is the uh, randomized. So we basically just a random, we take a random sample from um, mu from this measure. And the second part is deterministic. Um, and the, the first part is just preprocessing. You do it once and forget about it. So later you can. Uh... Okay, so so this is the the goal of the first uh, of the first uh, sampling step. So we basically showed that the, the the fact is that there exists a small n such as R D with the following property. For every two simple sets, and I will soon say what simple means, but simple means that it's an intersection of not too many half spaces. For every two simple sets, if the two sets have the same trace on N, they have the same intersection with, the, with, with N, then their difference, their symmetric difference has measured most epsilon. So if they agree on N on this small epsilon net, then they agree on all but an epsilon fraction of the measure. Okay, so I repeat, there exists a small epsilon net N with the property that for every two simple sets, if the two sets agree on the set N, they have the same intersection on N, then they agree on at least one minus epsilon measure of the space. There's the metric difference the point where they disagree is at most epsilon measure. So small here means poly d over epsilon. So d squared over epsilon, I think, is enough. Um, and simple here means union and intersections of at most d plus one half spaces. Okay, so any set that, that can be represented as a union or intersection of at most d plus one half spaces. And again, the, 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 the construction of the derivation of this epsilon at n is trivial. You just take n, you just take IID samples from the measure mu. And this follows from VC theory. The, the, the correctness of this assertion follows from VC theory. And so this is a kind of a standard uh, 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 fact in this context. Okay. So for the rest of the proof, we are going to fix such a set N and we will call it an epsilon net. 
Okay. Now we're going to, I'm going to describe the deterministic part that given a set H, a half phase H, I will use N, so we assume N is fixed, to construct a container C for H. And as I promised you, the, the description will use only D log D over epsilon bits. Okay, so now we're going to take a dual point of view. This is the only part where we need to concentrate a little bit, because it's always confusing to move to the dual, uh, to the dual uh, space. So consider the set P of all half spaces H prime, which have the same intersection with N, like the input half space H. Okay, so this is a family of half spaces. It's, it's an infinite family of half spaces. All those half spaces that have the same intersection on N, like the input half space H. If you think about it from a dual perspective, so you represent every half space using the normal vector, then this uh, set P is in fact a polytope in the dual space. Okay, a uh, convex combination of two such half spaces is also such a half space. It's a polytope. Moreover, the complexity of this polytope in the dual space is small. So, right, so for every point of in N, we have a constraint which, which says that uh, we need to agree on this point with the input half space H. So every constraint, every, every point in N defines a, a dual constraint in the dual space. The inner product with this point has to be the same, like, same sign like H like the inner product of H. So you see, we get a polytope in the dual space, and this polytope can be described by N, by, the, by, by, by uh, N half spaces. So the number of constraints is exactly the size of the epsilon net, N. This is where the dual curvature that we mentioned earlier will, will, will uh, kick in. Okay, so again, we take all half prime, which agree with H on the epsilon net, and we observe that in the dual space, it's a polytope, which is definable by absolute value N constraints. At most, right? At most, right, yeah. Okay. No, exactly. I mean, maybe somewhat more redundant, right? For every yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Every point in N defines a constraint. Maybe some of them are redundant, but uh, um, okay. Yeah, so, and in particular, it's the intersection of at most poly D over epsilon half spaces, because maybe some of them are redundant, as you said. Okay. And here is now where the dual curvature kicks in. So we have H, we have the input half space H. It is a point in the dual space. It is a point inside uh, this polytope in the dual space. And because of uh, Karateodori theorem, we know that this point belongs to a simplex of the polytope, to a sub-simplex of the polytope. Right, so this point can be this the, the, the input half space is a convex combination of at most d plus one half spaces in this polytope that are vertices of this polytope. And the observation, and this is again, it's a very simple calculation, but the, is that the union of the HI, union of these vertices, union of the half spaces corresponding to the vertices, epsilon contains H. So this union, it contains H because H is a convex combination of these half spaces. And if you have a half space, which is a convex combination of other bodies, other half spaces, then their union contains it. That's, this is just because of inner product. Um, and the reason it's epsilon contains it, the reason the difference is at most epsilon is because all of these half spaces agree with H on the set N. So we have a union of d plus one half spaces that this all of them agree with h on the epsilon net and because of the construction by the assumption by the definition of the epsilon net the difference between these two sets 
has the most uh, epsilon measure. So <clears throat> if we can somehow cover this polytope P using few synthesis, we can just send the, the, the name of the simplex. We can encode the, the, these D plus one half spaces by the name of the, of, of, of the particular simplex that covers the input point, the input half space. So if we can, if we can cover P using, let's say, K simplices, then we can encode a container for the input half space H using order of D log N plus log K bits. Why D log N plus log K? We need D log N bits to define the polytope, right? To define the, to write a constraint for every point in N, which says that we need to agree with H, with the input H. We need a list of D log N sides. Uh, and, um, and yes, and then, um, and then we need log K bits to, to, set, to, to specify the name of the simplex. And this follows from the dual curatorial theorem, right? We can, we can represent P using M half spaces, then we can cover it by M to the D sub simplices. And, uh, and together we get that the number of bits is D log D over epsilon. And I think I just ran out of time. Um, okay, so let me just summarize it. So um, the, the idea was to use this epsilon net, which defines the, this polytope of all half places that agree, and then we use Curitori theorem to get the simplex and the vertices of this simplex corresponds to the, the unions is the container. And in order to, to do things efficiently, we needed to improve this dual Curitori theorem. And uh, yeah, and that's basically it. Yeah, so it's not too simple, I guess, but, um, but I hope at least um, you get the flavor. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you applied the epsilon net, is there a union bound involved uh, for each of the? Uh, so do we get d times epsilon, or is it just epsilon? You mean uh, the derivation of the this uh, fact? What I call the this one. Yeah, so uh, no, uh, when you finally up got to apply it, you said, uh, so in a later slide, uh, yeah, if, that's right, somewhere here, the, you said union of HR, no, the previous one. Yes, so the last bullet, uh, so uh, yeah, so these were the half spaces mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so can, can, how do you justify the last bullet after this? Okay, so uh, so first of all, the fact that the reunion contains H, this follows because H is a convex combination of these HIs. So whenever you write a half space, uh -huh. you know, the normal and the bias, as a convex combination of other half spaces, then the union of the convex combination contains it as a set. So that's the, that's the part of containing. And the reason that the difference is at most epsilon is because each of these half spaces agrees with H on the epsilon net. Therefore also their union agrees with H on the epsilon net. Now this union is simple as we define simple, right? It's at most okay, okay, got it. It's a simple object. A simple object, yes. At most D plus one half spaces, that's why we use curatiology to get only few words. Okay. Good. Thanks. Sure. Um we maybe just yeah, yeah okay. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question about the algorithm, the upper bound uh, d log d log n. So, mm -hmm. 
after the first round is over where three four where one fourth of the universe is labeled uh do you have to get another family of containers or how does it work yes, definitely well that's very cor- that's uh, that's correct let's see it um, yeah so um so in each round we remove some of the points we remove at least a quarter of the remaining points and we build a family of containers for the remaining uh, for the point that remained so so do both the players get to learn which points are labeled like if alice labels the first set of points does she tell that to bob or no no so so they label it simultaneously right they label it together so uh, so notice that um, so let's uh, go bullet by bullet so Each of them checks whether there is a container with this property that contains all of their input plus at most one quarter of the point plus at most three quarters of the points. Yes. And one of them will succeed, right? Yeah. And then the party which succeeds sends the other party the name of such a container. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. So if Bob sends it, then both of them can label all of the examples all of the points outside the container like addresses like in the other because we know that all of the input is in all of the blue input uh, is being held by bob so we can label all points outside the container by red and we can just remove these points we don't we, we know that the labeling must be correct yes yes, yes. We, we cannot label we did not label any blue point red for sure and you can just remove these points and forget about them and proceed with the remaining uh, with the remaining points that's right okay okay i got it all right thanks sure um so let me maybe just quickly 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 mention a few open problems so some of them we already mentioned and then uh, then i'll let you go because i think there are many many open questions in this uh, Uh, yeah, so as I said, proper learning, right? What if we really want to learn a half space, right? Sometimes, you know, you really want to learn, uh, even in practice, you really want, like somehow the parameters of the half space, they encode some semantic of the features of, of the problem you want to learn. So what if you really, really want to learn a half space that separates the input? Can it be done in a similar complexity? It's not, we don't know. Um, what about agnostic learning? So what, what happens if, the, if there is no half, half, half space that separates the inputs perfectly? So maybe there is a half space that makes only uh, a small uh, number of uh, misclassifications. Can, you, can they agree on a good half space in this context? Okay. And there are some known bounds, but it's basically wide open. And of course, convex edge jointness. Where there is this quadratic uh, gap between the upper and lower bounds, and also you can consider more than two parties. This this work only considered the simplest kind of toy case of only two parties. In in practice, you want to consider many parties. Um, can can we do anything there? So when you say many parties, uh, you mean like the number in hand model? Yeah, number in hand makes more sense, right? The realistic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, uh, realistic problems it's a number in hand yeah so like each, in the co- like in the coordinator model or something like that right right any of these yeah any, any yeah 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 even the broadcast i mean you know any anything uh, we don't yeah mm-hmm. ah, i guess coordinator is like broadcast right up to a factor no 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 coordinator is like where you where there is a dedicated link and everybody sends it to the coordinator and uh, yeah okay Yeah, coordinator or even broadcast. Uh, I think it's. Uh, oh, okay. I guess coordinator is most realistic, right? When you have a central machine that coordinates the right. cloud. Yeah. But anyways, uh, yeah, a- a- any of these uh, models, I think it's. Uh, and yeah, and, uh, I-, I thought about uh, these variants a little bit, and uh, one thing I noticed for sure is that there is a lot of uh, nice uh, geometry and combinatorics that uh, arise. And so with containers, for instance, is an example just for the two-party, but then 
you have more code, you can you get colorful versions and uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's it. I will, uh, I will finish here. Uh, unless there are more questions and I'm happy to answer. Yeah, oh, uh, thanks. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, I still haven't learned how to do it on Zoom. Uh, maybe somebody can do it. Uh, show the clap symbol. <laughs> Uh, okay, so great talk. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess we asked you several questions, uh, but uh, yeah, if someone has more questions, uh, we can take it. Uh, I just have a vague question. I think probably some, I just wanted to know is there any relation to hypergraph containers? The containers you define and containers. Yes. That that's why I, I, I we chose this name because it's a, it's a little bit reminiscent of the uh, right so um, right you just replace independent sets with half spaces and you get a similar similar object right so so like can you uh, like from your result does something for hypergraphs follow or vice versa no, no. nothing like that only the like uh, I, I guess our notion is more general in the sense that you can consider any family of sets, half spaces, manifolds, I don't know, uh, varieties, polynomial inequalities, any 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 family, any set system really, and you can ask whether it has this, this container property or not. And in the context of hypergraphs, when your uh, when your family is just a family of independent sets of a given graph, then this was studied in a in this community. But uh, technically, I don't know of any, I mean, we did not use any of the, of the results there or techniques, it's, it's, it's quite different, technically. But, but, the, the, but, but you're right, this is the reason we chose this name, containers, because of the, because the definition is somewhat similar. Okay. How Thanks. important was uh, hyperplanes? Because in the end, you used VC dimensions to build the epsilon net. So, uh, sorry, how important was half spaces? Uh, would other families that had low VC dimension also work in this way? So that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, so first of all, notice that we did use the uh, geometry. Although it's true that the epsilon net, we only use the, the VC, but later we use this Cartiodary, the dual Cartiodary, and all of these uh, uh, very geometric uh, properties. And we also know, and it, it, it's in the paper, uh, of examples of PC dimension two that do not have this property, or you cannot uh, find the, uh, this theorem does not apply for them, even when epsilon is one quarter, so you cannot find the family of containers, uh, projective planes, it's a so finite field, basically. And in general, we don't know um, what is the VC dimension? What is the combinatorial dimension that captures this, this property of, of, of uh, containers of the existence of containers? And yeah, and I think it's it's a great question. It's a very interesting question to study this property. And as I said before, this notion of containers is in some sense equivalent to a notion of, called bracketing in statistics and cutting planes in discrete geometry. So it's, uh, it's also, it appears in many contexts. Variants of it appears in many contexts. Okay. So if there are no more questions, I guess that's it uh, for now. Uh, so Shai, it seems like you had several uh, uh, slides that you couldn't show because of a lack of time. I mean, I would appreciate if you send if you send us the slides, then we can share it. Of course, of course. Can... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I send the PowerPoint or do you want a PDF or? 
whatever. actually a pdf might be better because uh, sometimes cross devices it messes up the powerpoint thing right so, no problem okay yeah i'll send you a pdf version sure okay